Well, thank you, and let me tell you, it's, um, it's an honor, a privilege, and a responsibility to be here and um, address this uh, committee and this important topic. And uh, I'm here today to speak about my experience uh, with Robert Robeson um, and learning about his case. And I want to talk about what I've done uh, to be able to speak about this. Um, I've uh, reviewed the transcripts and supporting documents from his trial. Um, I've done an intensive forensic interview uh, with him. And I, I think I am in a position to do that because uh, a lot of my career, decades, um, have been spent in the legal arena, uh, both civil and criminal. Um, and in, in terms of my training, uh, so people know, uh, I, I do have ex extensive training in clinical uh, psychology and behavioral medicine or medical psychology uh, from the great University of North Texas. Um, in their PhD program, and then I completed uh, a postdoctoral fellowship in forensic psychology, um, and um, spent a lot of time uh, working in the litigation arena for a big part of my uh, professional career. And not to bury the lead, I am 100% convinced that we're facing a miscarriage of justice here. Uh, I say that because I do not believe uh, that Mr. Roberson has had due process in this case. I do not believe he has yet uh, enjoyed a fair trial uh, in this matter. And I'll talk about that um, in, in detail. I believe that in the United States of America, if we are going to deprive someone of their liberty, that comes at a very high standard. If we are going to deprive someone of their life, that comes at a very high standard. A very high standard of proof, a very high standard of evidence, and when you say beyond a reasonable doubt, that's said so much that I think sometimes it can lose its meaning, and we have to really stop and think what that means. That means that if you have 12 people on a jury, that means that there should be nothing. That 12 people can go in a room and reasonably disagree about. That, 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 and that is a high standard, that there's not, there should not be anything that they would go in there and say, well, there's nothing here that we can reasonably disagree about. And um, I, I think that when we talk about due process and fair trial, that means that all the evidence, everything that is relevant and pertinent to that trial gets before the trier of fact, whether it be a judge or a jury, and that there's fair representation. And I certainly don't think that standard has been met here, that that high standard by which we would deprive someone of their life um, has been met. And I think that the death penalty uh, actually hangs in the balance here because if we get this wrong in, in a case like this, uh, I think that uh, the death penalty could come under real attack. And, and there are circumstances where I personally believe that it is appropriate. Um, I think back to James Byrd Jr. on 6798 when uh, he, he was dragged uh, by King and Brewer in Jasper, Texas. And subsequently, uh, King was Brewer was executed in, in 2011 and King was executed in 2019. Uh, a third man got life in prison. I, I look at cases like that and think, you know, there are times where the death penalty just seems appropriate. Um, and it, it would be a, 
uh, I think it would be unfortunate if that was taken off the table. I'm also aware in circumstantial cases how powerful it is for an expert, a physician, for example, to come before a jury and render an opinion. Um, and I, 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 I've spent so much time uh, in cases and debriefing jurors after a case and know how heavily that weighs on those jurors. And I believe in this case that there was what I would refer to as triad tunnel vision because there was a, a shaken baby syndrome that was defied, defined uh, by a triad of symptoms. And those symptoms were subdural hematoma, brain swelling, and retinal hemorrhaging. And that was believed uh, to define the syndrome of shaken baby. And we now know from an evolution of science that that's just simply not the case. That there are a number of other explanations for those syndromes and that that causation has actually been debunked. And as a result, uh, the, the Daubert test, the Daubert test, um, junk science, it's just been debunked as it's no longer a, a standard that you can look to in, in defining that. And I think that once that was uh, looked at as the order of the day, everybody got tunnel vision. And, you know, there's something in psychology known as confirmation bias. And it's been around for a long time. Bacon first talked about it in 1889. And confirmation bias is the tendency for people to make up their mind to something and they close off openness to alternative explanations. They seek and find and hear and process only data that supports their initial belief. And they turn a deaf ear, a deaf eye, a deaf ear and a blind eye to anything other than what they passionately believe to be the case. And I think we have clear evidence that that's what happened in this case. Um, the decision was this triad of symptoms were written down and it started with the doctors that were looking at this first and then it trickled down to investigators and police and went right through the trial process, including Mr. Roberson's defense counsel including his own counsel. And uh, I, I've heard and read those that are opposing these efforts say that, well, this really wasn't the crux of this case. It wasn't really uh, what was going on here. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I've studied this trial transcript and it was the crux of this case. It was the center of this case. Uh, in, in, in one summary that I've looked at, uh, as well, I've read a summary and I've read the actual transcript, uh, I stopped counting it 47 times it was mentioned uh, in the trial transcript. Shaken baby syndrome, shaken baby case, shaken baby syndrome, shaken baby case, uh, triad of symptoms. And let me tell you something that will seem incredibly obvious, but it is not. Juries decide these things on what they see and hear, not on what they don't see and hear. And you would think, well, yeah. But my point is, I, I've often seen lawyers try to get something into the record and it's kept out and heard them say, well, we didn't get that in, but the jury knows we had something really powerful <laughs> and that's going to stick with them. No, it's not. They decide on what they see and hear, not what they don't see and hear. And there was a massive amount of outcome determinative, exculpatory evidence that was never reviewed. It was never put in front of the jury. 
It was never heard. And you always hear, and the law is clear, that the burden of proof is on the prosecution. That Mr. Robeson does not have to prove that he didn't do this. The prosecution has to prove that he did. And that's great in theory. But having spent decades in the litigation arena, I can tell you debriefing juror after juror after juror after juror across decades, they have taught me that they sit back and say, if we're not down here for the reason that the prosecution says we are, somebody needs to explain to me an alternative explanation. Because we know these cases get resolved a hundred different ways before we ever get to this point. So if we're not down here for the reasons that they say we are, somebody needs to explain why. They're looking for an alternative explanation. And in this case, oh my gosh, was there an alternative explanation. This child was an ill baby. From eight days old, the medical record shows this, was, this child was not well. The record shows that this baby had 46 doctor or hospital visits in her 23 months and few weeks of life. In the days leading up to her death, the record shows she had a 104.5 temperature. The record shows that Robert took her to the doctor twice in the week leading up to her collapse. The record shows that she was prescribed Finnegan on two days leading, two separate days leading up to her death. A black box warning says you do not prescribe this medication to someone under two years of age. On the second administration, it was Finnegan with codeine, a double impact that suppresses the respiratory system. We did not hear that this child had severe pneumonia. We did not hear that. And there were scans available to be looked at, and the medical examiner admitted that they were not looked at. And I will provide to the committee, this is a calendar of the two years of this child's life, and every red notation, every red notation is a doctor or hospital visit during her young life. Uh, this was a child that was acutely and chronically ill. And when I say that this child had been diagnosed uh, with inter interstitial uh, pneumonia, on the left is a scan of her lungs and the, the pinkish red is non-functional lung tissue, according to the doctors, and I'm telling you just what the report says. I'm not playing physician here. And on the right is a normal lung. This never got in front of a jury. <coughs> Why? Uh, because it was never looked at. It, it was never looked at. The medical examiner, medical examiner did not uh, review this and said so. Um, this child had collapsed several times when Robert Robeson was not in this child's life. This wasn't the first time this child collapsed and turned blue and had respiratory shutdown. It had happened a number of times when he wasn't around. On this occasion, he was around and took the child uh, to the hospital. Um, so how was this case tried without all of this stuff being put into the record? 
it's it's astounding. It's astounding. Uh, even the defense counsel, who did nothing to challenge the evidence, stipulated that this was a shaken baby case. Um, during voir dire, I'm quoting defense counsel, every one of you related to that you had heard the term shaken baby, that it was an act of basically a lack of control of emotion. It's a bad thing but it's not something that rises to the level of capital murder. His own counsel says this was a shaken baby case. In opening statement, his defense counsel says, this is, however, a shaken baby case. The evidence will show that Nikki did suffer injuries that are totally consistent with those applied by rotational forces, more commonly known as shaken baby syndrome. <clears throat> now, Robert Roberson was offered plea deal after plea deal after plea deal and never took a plea deal because he said, I never did anything to this child. I never put my hands on this child in anger. I didn't hurt this child. I didn't do anything to this child. I'm not going to take a plea deal for something I didn't do. But yet his counsel stands up and says, um, more commonly known as shaken baby syndrome. On page 35 of the closing argument, defense counsel says, yes, I came here in opening and presented to you that there is responsibility in this case. Yes, this is a shaken baby case, but no, this is not a murder case. His counsel is stipulating this is shaken baby. And the science has marched on and now rebutted that shaken baby syndrome is a valid medical syndrome. Has said you, you cannot rely on that. That is junk science. We've now evolved to a level that says we know that shaken baby as defined then does not create that triad of symptoms and that that triad of symptoms can be created by a number of other things such as uh, over medication, uh, pneumonia, you could just go down the checklist here of what happened in this case. It has been reported that there was an expert psychologist that supposedly recommended to Robert, just take a plea deal, go to prison, and you can kill yourself once you're there. Now, I can't verify that. I can just tell you it's in the record and has been reported. But yet he refused those plea deals um, and went to trial where the jury was wrongly told that abuse could explain, that only abuse could explain the death, and they heard nothing about this child's acute or chronic illness. Now, there's another factor that comes into play here. The jury was told that Mr. Robeson was guilty because he didn't respond in an expected way at the hospital when he brought the child in. Flat affect. They were not informed that he was autistic. And that did not come to to light until 2018, many years later, when he had an active counsel that actually got him examined and formally diagnosed. Um, we see all through this man's life, uh, which was not a spotless life, let me tell you. Uh, he got involved with drugs at one point, he uh, uh, burgled a house at one point, 
uh, violated his probation, but never uh, is there any evidence of him being violent with other people, assaulting other people, uh, having impulse control disorder, rage, uh, anything of that nature. Uh, there is testimony uh, that he was bullied uh, because he was different and lacked social skills that are typically associated uh, with autism or frequently associated with autism, but he never retaliated. I sat across from uh, Mr. Robeson at the Polunsky unit and I've spent a lot of my professional career uh, studying and practicing deception detection and interrogation. Uh, I've worked with law enforcement locally, federally, um, in, in, in developing these skills and, and techniques. Um, so I didn't just go have a therapy session with him. I didn't just go talk to him. Um, I was very mindful of um, deceptive behaviors. And I'm the first to say there are no lie behaviors. People talk about that like there are lie behaviors. There are not. But there are behaviors that correlate with lying. There are behaviors that show up when someone is <clears throat> Uh, goes into a stress mode that is associated with not telling the truth and uh, creating something um, that is misdirection, trying to take you away from uh, something they don't want you to know about them. I ask him hard questions. Um, I ask him point blank, straight up, looking him square in the eye, did you harm this child? Did you shake this baby? Did you put your hands on this, this child uh, in, in anger? Did you neglect this child? Did you fail to get this child to a hospital in a timely fashion? Um, he said he had been criticized for putting the child in the car and racing to the hospital instead of calling 911 and waiting for the ambulance. He said he made the judgment call. He could get her there faster. Um, but he was forthcoming and, and straightforward. Um, you know, it took years for specialists to put the pieces together, the pieces that the medical examiner never did. And I think sometimes with my years in the litigation arena, that sometimes we forget that the goal of prosecution is to seek justice, not conviction. I think sometimes in the heat of battle and with so much time invested in cases that it's easy to forget that the goal is to seek justice. And if you get in the middle of a case and you determine, wait a minute, I've got the wrong person here or I can now see that no crime was committed. That this was a case explained by medicine. This was a case explained by disease. I need to walk away from this one. And when you have a medical examiner that has admitted they never looked at the child's medical records, including the final week where there were multiple doctor visits and even the child's last two days when extraordinary efforts were made to save the child's life, which meant there were efforts made to stop the swelling and relieve the pressure in the brain. Yes, there were things done to the child's uh, head. Uh, but if you look at the pathology reports, they contradict uh, what was concluded at the time, that there were multiple blunt force trauma to the baby's head. You, you look at the uh, pathology reports, they say that's not true. There was one minor uh, trauma to the head that would come if the baby fell out of bed. 
Uh, all of those things were available. And, and these things not being considered, that's on the state. The state that's seeking to execute this man. And that's why I say there was not um, due process in this case. There were people that, in my opinion, did not do their job. No one, including me, can say with 100% certainty what happened in that house that morning. My professional opinion is that this is not a man with malice. This is not someone that hurt this child. What I can tell you that goes beyond opinion after examining the record in this case, the trial transcript in this case, the medical records in this case, this man has not had due process. This man has not had a fair trial. And if we start executing people in Texas absent due process, absent fair trial, we are going down a really dangerous road. That is not something that I can support. And I know that has not happened. As I say, it's a very high standard to take someone's life. We must have the courage to make choices that matter at times that count, and it is always the right time to do the right thing. I welcome this committee's questions.